welcome to the Heartful Parent Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Keating. In this podcast, we talk about it all, our parenting, our partnering, and our professional lives, because they are all a part of us, and we were never meant to do this alone. Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Heartful Parent Podcast. Um, As you know, on this podcast, we talk about all aspects of our lives as parents. So we talk about parenting, we talk about partnering, we talk about sort of, you know, ourselves and self-care, and we talk about our professional lives. And today's episode really brings all of that together with a topic that affects how effective and how good we feel in each one of those spaces. And that is the topic, brace yourselves, of effective time management. Now I know that if you are, you know, like many of us, including me, you hear the words time management, you go, oh my God, I don't wanna hear about this. Time management is a myth, it doesn't work. Uh, Planning, I don't have time for planning. Like, this is just not the episode for me. I want you to suspend disbelief for a moment. Because if for no other reason, then this was just a super fun interview. I I truly, truly enjoyed uh, speaking with today's guest. There's a little bit of kismet there. I think, uh, you know, we live on opposite sides of the country. But if we lived close, I'm like, we'd have a good time having a glass of wine together. But also because there is so much wisdom to be taken away with today's guests' words. And it's wisdom that I have actually used and continue to use and am continuing to build on and learn from. Um, And you'll hear about that. And it is information and wisdom that I know you can also use, whoever you are, right? If you are a stay-at-home parent, if you are a, you know, work out of the home parent, if you are a work from home and also parent, right? Like all of the things. If you're a grandparent, right? If you are an educator, uh, the information that we're going to talk about today, it will help you. I promise. I promise. I promise. So if I've now got you feeling sort of suspenseful enough, I'm going to introduce today's guest. Her name is Megan Summerall. And Megan is the CEO and founder of a fabulous company called The Pink Bee. And as a business owner, a mom, and a wife, she knows just how hard it is to juggle all the things while still managing your own sense of self. I think this is something that many of us moms struggle with. You know, I'm also a business owner, a mom, and a wife, and these things are hard. But Megan helps uh, bring work-life harmony to women through all things time management, organization, and productivity. But I will say she is not your average like productivity expert. She brings super real, thoughtful um, productivity, really time management tips for the most unorganized among us to those people who are like, my life is way too busy, too disorganized. There's too many unpredictable aspects of it. Megan has like the, the systems that can, can really, really help that. And uh, like I said, and also she's just fun and a really lovely person to chat with. So without further ado, I think you're going to love this conversation with Megan Summerall. Megan, welcome to the Heartful Parent Podcast. Thank you. I've been looking forward to this all day. I am so excited to have you here. I've been looking forward to it too, because as you and I were just talking before we hit record, like we've we've known of each other's work. I, you know, follow your stuff, but we've never really met. No, it was so funny when I got your email. I was like, why are you in Of course I know who you are. Like, this is crazy. Uh, so I know, I feel like I, I know you. So this makes it really fun. Oh, good. Well, I'm I'm really excited to dive into this conversation. You know, the other thing that I, I said to you before we hit record that um, regular listeners have probably heard me talk about before, but our U.S. Surgeon General just came out with an advisory um, that and an article in the New York Times that really lays out the the fact that parents right now, you know, post-pandemic, 
as we've dived back into quote unquote regular life, they are more stressed than ever. They're more lonely than ever. They are more overwhelmed. They're more, they're experiencing, um, you know, higher levels of uh, exhaustion and stress. Um, and they need support and help. And I, I can hear a parent because I work with some of these parents who are like, when I'm like, well, let's talk about how we can manage your day. And they'll say, I'm too busy for planning. And besides, right, my schedule is so unpredictable. It's way too crazy. It's not going to help anyway. And as somebody who teaches planning, I'd love to know what your response is to that. Yeah. And it's, it's common. The, the belief we have is the more unpredictable my days are, right? The more flexible I need to be for all the unknowns and the busier I am, then we believe that planning would be a waste of time. And what's the point if I'm going to create a plan, but then something's, you know, I'm going to get the phone call that derails everything. So why bother? Yeah. And the actual opposite is what's really true, which is the more chaotic your life feels, the more you are juggling and the more unpredictability you have, you are someone that needs planning actually more than somebody who doesn't. Um, and I, I just want to let that sink in for a middle. And I know many listeners are probably like, this lady has no idea what she's talking about. Um, but there are a bunch of reasons why that we can go through that this actually can serve you well. And I think a great place to start is to understand that plans are not immovable. Right. And when you learn how to plan the right way, because there is bad planning 100%, but when you learn how to plan the right way, meaning one that's including all the realities of your life and having the ability for you to change it as needed, it's what I call planning for uncertainty, what that is actually going to do for you is it's going to reduce your overwhelm and your anxiety, and it's going to help you absorb those pivots and changes so much easier. It's like if you're keeping the the typical mental ticker tape going, right? Which most parents have of all all this stuff. And oh God, did I get the soccer uniform? And then the this. Oh, why my report due tomorrow? And oh God, is it time for someone's well check? Right? Just the the nonstop things that are coming through. If that's how we're operating, and then one of those emergencies comes, or that curveball hits, or today's the day you wake up and your kid barfs everywhere, or whatever it is. If you're trying to store all the things you're juggling in your head or even on a task list, and now a curveball comes in, it's a, a death spiral from there, yes. right? Because we can't see how to, what, where do we go from here? Like, oh my God, how am I going to make this happen? If you have a plan, one that can absorb change, all mapped out for here are the things that I need to do and here's when I'm doing them. Notice I'm not saying a task list, but a plan. Now, when something comes in that derails you, your brain has something visual to go to, to take a step back and say, okay, how am I going to handle this? And now it's like moving a puzzle around a little bit. And so this is the style of planning that is so important for parents to learn how to do, because what it's doing is it's taking all that mental stress out of their head. And there's neuroscience behind the importance of getting it where your brain can see it instead of storing it. Right. And now you have the ability to move things around easier. You can see where you need to say no. You can see where you need to lean in or let go. Um, and so this is why I always say planning the right way. It's not a, well, this is what I said I'm doing and I'm doing it. And that's that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that you say that because uh, I mean, I was definitely one of those people that was, I know, not planning in the right way. And last year when I was I, too. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it is overwhelming and, and I'm not going to claim perfection. I still go there sometimes, but you know, when I took your program last year and you were like, there's ways to plan and make it flexible, as you said, like a puzzle that was really eye opening for me. Yeah. Um, now you mentioned like there are wrong ways to go about planning. So what do you, like, what are some of the wrong ways? What are some of the biggest mistakes that people make so, when you try to plan? The biggest mistake most people make, and their intention is good. And unfortunately, most productivity and time management experts teach people to do this. And there's an entire planning community built around it. 
the biggest mistake most people make is operating from a daily to-do list. Mm -hmm. And before everyone freaks out and goes, well, how the heck am I supposed to remember how to do anything? The, the list of things isn't the problem. It's the fact that you're operating from a list. So there are some major like horrible consequences when we do this. And unfortunately, most people are told, wake up, you know, write down everything that you need to get done for the day, right? And then someone threw in somewhere, identify your top three. There's no science behind that. There's no evidence that there's anything around the number three, uh, uh -huh. but somehow you're magically supposed to just work on those and then later do everything else, right? Which I've always been like, what? I, I have 29 things to do. Thank you. I'm like, so are the other 29 not important? Like those yeah. have to get done too. So then we end up paralyzed in well, what are the top three, right? Um, so let's say you've got this magic list and realistically, you could easily have 22, 23 things on it in a day, right? Some things might only take one minute. Some things on there could be an hour of your time. So the list in and amongst itself gives you no clarity into, is this even achievable today? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I like to kind of give the analogy. It would be like me giving you a list of food to go get at the grocery store and not telling you how much money I'm giving you. And then you get to the register and they ring it all up and they're like, you know, $173. And then you open up the envelope and you go, oh my God, but I only have 20. And this is what we're, this is what most of us are doing. We're making a list, not realizing this could be nine hours of stuff, but the reality of your day is you've got three. Yes. Yeah. So then you go to bed feeling like a failure, right? Because yep. it must be me. I didn't get it all done. I used to be able to, and now I can't. So what's wrong with me? And then tomorrow you start your day rewriting half of yesterday's list and then adding to it. And oh my we just God. Totally. We perpetuate this, right? Yes. And that, that internal dialogue that you just described, like, I know there are so many people that can relate to it, including me, where you, you know, it, especially when I forget some of the things I learned from you and I fall back into my, I just got to write the list and get it, you know, whatever it is. And then I come to the end of the day and my husband will be like, how was your day? And I'm like, it was terrible. Because I got three things done and there's, you know, the, the 29 are well, still there's going to get done. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then and you so feel bad that, and then, yeah. Yeah. And so it keeps us always in kind of that high level of anxiety because we can't see when am I going to get this done? When am I going to get this done? This is why I say a task list is not a plan. It's just a, a dumping ground, right? Yeah. Now, the other thing that is really fascinating of working from a list all day um, and I'm sure everyone can relate to this experience of um, decision fatigue, right? So yeah. it's the end of the day. You've had a day. The whole family's had a day. You all decide we're going out to dinner. And for some reason in our house, everyone always looks to me, mom. They're like, where do you want to go? And it's one of those days like for the love of God, somebody else, please decide. Like I physically cannot make another decision today. Well, if you're working from a really long task list, that's probably why. So when we wake up every morning, our brains have a limited capacity of decision-making mode. Some people like to call it willpower, um, but it's just, you have this limited capacity and there's no way to refill it throughout the day. When it's gone, it's gone. And it only restores when we go to bed at night and sleep. Now, if you have a long list of 22 things, and you are looking at it going, which one should I do first? You're making a decision. Mm -hmm. And the more things you give your brain to decide from, the harder it has to work. So like, if I just show you an apple and an orange, say, what do you want? Your brain's going to, you know, that's easy. Right. If I hold out a basket of 25 different pieces of fruit and ask you to pick one, now your brain's like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> so we just pulled a lot more energy. Well, when you make the list, your, your instant thought is, oh my gosh, how am I going to get it all done? And you start to feel a little anxious. Well, then your brain triggers into the exact same chemical reaction as fight or flight. So this, your brain's doing the same thing as if a like bear walked into your office. And what our brain is programmed to do is to save us, right? If the bear comes in, obviously it's going to tell you run. Well, when it's in that overwhelming anxiety by looking at this long list, what your brain does is says, I've got to feel better and I'm going to feel better by crossing something off my list as fast as possible. So what it's going to pick is the easiest, usually lowest hanging fruit item on there, which 99% of the time is not the important thing that we yeah. needed to do.
right? Yep. But it's going to do that to get the check mark. We got our dopamine hit. It reduces our anxiety a little bit, but we've just made a decision. Yeah. So now we go back to our list and now we're making another decision. So we're making these micro decisions all day long, asking our brain to do one of the things that has the hardest time doing, which is deciding. And then we wonder by 3.30 in the afternoon, why am I so exhausted and I need to go to Starbucks again? Yeah. Because you've, you've tapped it out by working from the list that the intent behind it was great, which is, is I need, I need this to make sure I don't forget anything. Yeah. But the list is actually causing more harm than good. That is such a revolutionary idea because I know, um, as a, as a lifelong list maker and, and I love the dopamine hit, right? It is. I still so write satisfying. the first thing on my list is make the list, right? So you can check something off. I mean, they're in there because there is a time and a place for a list. Of course, I make a list when I go to the grocery store, right? right. I don't want to forget what I need to buy there. But this never ending growing, the minute you check one off, three things come onto it way to try and stay on top of everything. Mm -hmm. It never ends. There's, mm -hmm. It's never going to get finished and you're never going to get relief. Oh, totally. I, I will say two things to that one. I'm such, I have been such a crazy list maker that, and I, I know there's someone listening who can relate to this. I've done a task and then I've written it on the list just so I can. Okay. Check it off. I do that with my house cleaning. Like if I make a list of like, okay, this weekend, I'm going to do these three things that I don't like. And then I do another one. I write it down. To stop. So yeah. Okay, good. I'm not the only one out there. I love but, that. That makes me laugh. Oh God. It, and yeah, my husband laughs at me because lists stress him out, right? They just freak him out when I'm making lists. The other thing I used to do, and I don't do this anymore, but I used to keep like a composition notebook mm -hmm. and I kept it and no joke. This one notebook lasted me probably five years front and back every page it was a list of things to do. And every time I hit 100, I'd start again, I'd write a little line and I'd start again on 100. And there's still things in that notebook that never got done. I, isn't that crazy? Like, I feel like I'm starting to sweat just even <laughs> thinking about that. It oh. has been years. I started that in like 2011. And I think it lasted me about five years before I filled it. And when it was done, I was like, I'm not doing that again. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's how deeply ingrained this idea of working from a list. Mm -hmm. I think is. I mean, there's entire planning companies and planner systems built around that. And what's interesting is, I mean, I, I used it for years. I did all the Franklin Covey courses. I used a Franklin Covey planner for over 20 years. But here's here's the difference. So when I was, when I first started doing that, you know, I'm 51 now, I've got a 14 year old daughter, two dogs, um, you know, run a business, all of that. Yep. When I first started doing this, I'm in my twenties, I'm single, I'm old enough that we didn't have laptops. There was no home internet. There was no cell phones. I carried a pager because I was in charge of a computer system. And if it went off, I had to go find a cell phone to call in from, right? Yes which meant the volume of information and things coming at me 30 years ago was nothing like what we are dealing with and juggling now. And even just thinking about our kids, right? Long gone is the day of you come home with the Friday folder and all the communication that you needed from the school is in that one place, you know, to look for it. Now it's this teacher uses that, this teacher uses that, but then you've got kids in three different schools and they're each on different platforms. And then with this school, you got to download this app for school notifications, but with this one, this one, and oh, but this kid's soccer team is using, this, right? It's out of control. And so these antiquated systems that I felt served me and others really well, 30, even 20-ish ish years ago, yep. Yep. they are not addressing the fact that this just flat out doesn't work anymore because there is way too much coming in that we need to filter, organize, and figure out how to create a plan around. Totally. Uh, as a fellow 51-year-old. <laughs> magic yay. number. Yay, yay, magic number. Yay, 1973. Um, I, I completely relate. And I made it through all of law school with those antiquated lists because, you know, we are as the same age, like, I didn't have. They weren't very laptop. long. 
<laughs> no, I mean, I took notes in law school on, I took the bar exam by handwriting it. Yeah. Like, they don't do that anymore. Um, and everything was written that like the internet, I remember when I first got internet service during law school and I, and the internet provider was on the phone with them as I was getting it set up and they said, okay, so go to a website to see if it works. And I was like, I, I don't know what, a, like what website would what you, you mean? suggest? <laughs> like I, I have no idea yeah. where to go. Um, and now of course, as I was telling you earlier, like I have 79 tabs open on my computer so that I don't forget something, yeah. the modern checklist maybe. And I think that this is just my maybe unpopular opinion, but I, you know, I, so I love technology at heart. I'm not here to bash it. Um, I was a technologist for over 20 years. I worked in the software space. I'm a total tech nerd, but technology is a lot of people blame social media for overwhelm and social media is its own bucket I don't believe social media is the cause for overwhelm. I think technology at a whole is a cause for overwhelm because I believe it allows people to get, to honestly just be very lazy and pass the buck off. Yeah. And I see it with, um, I see it in more corporate style offices, especially now where everybody's using Slack or this, or you know, whatever the tool is you know, years ago, if my boss had an idea and like wanted to task me with something, we didn't even have like, nobody had email, right? Inner office yeah. email was all, was it. There was a meeting that was set up. People came into a room, we discussed it. We made a plan, right? There was conversation. Now they're pulling up their phones while they're sitting at a stoplight, opening up their Slack app, voice texting something. Hey, I want to do blah, 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 blah. And now they're like, done. Yeah. Right. And they don't yeah. know that they did that 27 times in the last three days. And this poor person on the other end is like, oh my gosh, I just got three months worth of work assignment due to this fleeting idea that people have that then they just pull up their technology and now they're dump, they're passing the buck off to someone else. It's this quick exchange of information. And then two days that, well, didn't you get my message? Which one? <laughs> Right. You know, you, you gave me 32 tasks in the last three days. Which one are you even talking about? Yeah. And so yeah. that is just adding for parents out there that are feeling overwhelmed. You should be. It's 100% right that you are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that just paints such a vivid picture because when we take that and put that together, you know, most people work for someone, you know, the overwhelming majority of people um, who have a, an out of the home job have an employer Yep. So, you know, you've got that going on over there. And then as you just described school a minute email. ago, then we've got all the school emails, you know, and as I was telling you, um, we're recording this during my, the first week of school for my girls and the number of messages from different teachers and different, th you know, and my, my teenager, cause I have a 15 year old, she actually had to sit down and hand write out like on a piece of paper for herself. Where do I find the assignments? for each class, because even within the same school, yeah, it's different. One teacher uses teams and one teacher uses something else. And, you know, where do I find the assignments? Oh, and by the way, if I need to go to the bathroom during that class, do I have to ask her, can I just get up and go? She literally wrote herself like a master mm -hmm. sheet. Well, and think about it with your, with your poor kids. I actually I just recorded a podcast episode on this. That's a three-step planning process for teens to use to help them with this exact problem. But I know for me as a parent, my daughter's in ninth, just starting ninth grade. And I'm like, I had to take a step back and, and realize she essentially has seven bosses, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine, you know, if you're listening to this and you work outside the home, you have a boss. Imagine if you had seven of them tasking you and none of them cared about what the other one was doing or how they were doing it or when their projects were due. And it really helps me kind of go, okay, like I've got to instill these skills in my daughter to say, you too now have seven bosses that, that are tasking you. And so how do we create that central hub of information for you to create a plan for you on how you're going to navigate the next, you know, one to 10 days of after school activities, 
plus same day homework, plus long-term projects. Yeah. Um, it's a lot for them to get their heads around. It is. And I'm like, okay, well, my daughter will be listening to that podcast <laughs> this weekend. <laughs> we will definitely be tuning in for that one. Um, and I, and I've actually thought like, it would be really helpful for her and I to sit down and go, you've got amazing content, which I know we'll talk about, but like for her to, to go through some of that with me as well, just yeah. to kind of realize that it doesn't have to feel as overwhelming as sometimes it does. Well, and it, and kind of when we talk about that overwhelm at the beginning, it can feel so overwhelming for them too, because we're not teaching our kids planning, Right. So they're going to the one tool they know, which is their brain, and they're trying to store it all in there. And then maybe each teacher requires their own separate notebook. So maybe they're writing down stuff, but now it's in, across seven different notebooks, right? So then yeah. how can they get it? And so, of course, they're overwhelmed, but there are tools that we can you know, teach them to help them. I always call it a central information hub, right? Let's get everything together where now we can see it and create this plan from it instead of just looking at a mile long list of, oh my gosh, how am I going to get all this done? Yes. Yes. I, I love that idea. And, um, I, I like my brain is just going, Ooh, how can I, you know, what do we need to do with the teenager? My seven-year-old is that's living the, large as yeah. they should be. <laughs> that's right. She is living her best life right now. Fantastic. Although if you ask her, she'd be like, I want to grow up faster. And I'm like, honey, of course <laughs> it ain't all it's cracked up <laughs> um okay so we we've, we've talked to, you know about the overwhelm and there's a lot of things that we do wrong mostly this list making that is so so pervasive um in our culture and i think it's because we don't know a different way to do it no. Because right. we're not, we don't teach it. It's not taught in schools. It's, you know, and, and then everyone thinks you're either born with that gene, right? Or not. Yeah. And that's yeah. nonsense too, because I was not born with that gene <laughs> at all. I just happened to land myself in a career where I went through a significant amount of training and education and certifications around all sorts of topics on process, leaning out, um, all these different practices that yeah. I've been able to pull from to create my planning framework. Yeah. Which I love. And let's talk. So let's sort of talk about that a little bit because you talk about there being like four levels of planning. Yes. Um, and I, you know, I think most people would be like, wait a minute, there's more than one, there's more than oh, one what level. Are you talking about here? Yeah. yeah. So, what so are the four I, levels? I usually, where I usually start people and where they find me is they start to learn my weekly planning process. Mm -hmm. um, and I love for people to start there because it's what gets us out of the weeds the quickest and helps us like kind of lasso and tame that task list and learn how to translate your traditional task list into a plan instead of it just being that decision fatigue, never ending <laughs> nightmare that it can be. And so weekly planning is where I like for people to start. And so all of our planning is usually done in a seven day window. Now you have the flexibility of when that's going to work for you in your life. Like right now, I used to always plan on Sundays for the upcoming week. Lately, I found Fridays when I'm wrapping up for uh, like before I go pick my daughter up from school is when I'm doing my planning for the next week. Yeah. And when we're doing our planning, it is not, which is what most people think planning is, it's not look at your calendar and see what appointments you have for next week. And then next to it, write the list of everything that we're going to get done in between all those, right? Because that's just a glorified task list. It's just a bigger one. But the way I teach planning is we actually look at, so yes, there will be a form of a list. Here's every, you know, here's what I'm currently committed to. Here are all the things that are competing for my time that I know about right now. And then we actually start to put structure into our week, picking specific dates and times that we're going to work on groups of stuff. Like I always have a 90 minute block of time on my calendar every week that I call my household COO time, right? It's when I get caught up on all the school emails and the, you know, just the general operational house stuff. Yeah. They're coming at me all the time, but I just let them pile up because I know it's better for me to sit down and go, okay, now I'm going to sit down and just put that, get into that mode 
And I know that I have that block of time to handle it. So what's nice is as things are coming at me during the week or my husband pops in a, Hey, we've got to remember, or could we, or my daughter, can we, I'll be like, they all know that they have to email me that stuff. That's how I require them to give me info. And then I get to relax and not stress about going, when am I going to get it done? Because yeah. I can look at my plan for the week and go, hey, you know what? Sunday morning, I'm actually going to have quiet time in my office. And that's when I'm going to handle all of my household stuff for the week. So we are actually very intentionally starting to build some specificity around it. Now, I mentioned earlier, what about, you know, what happens if Sunday morning is the morning we wake up and the dog needs to go to the vet, right? Yeah. Well, one of the tools that I teach in this weekly planning process is everybody is going to have their own amount of uncertainty that they need to prepare for and plan for. Think of it like an emergency fund financially, right? Most financial advisors would tell you, you need to have some kind of an emergency fund yeah. for when the air conditioner breaks or the need to replace your tires or whatever. But how much you need in the bank might be different than how much I need. And we learn that by historically going back and looking at our finances saying, on average, how much am, is, is happening to me per year unexpectedly? And now we can start to build that, that fund waiting there. Right. Well, we do the same thing with our planning. We actually learn by tracking it for a week or two of how much of my time each day you know, of this week did I have to stop doing what I wanted to do and handle something that I didn't know was going to be coming at me. Yep. So then once we've learned this, like right now for me, I'm, I'm at a place where it's usually about four to four and a half hours per week. So what that allows me to do when I create my weekly plan is I block and protect four and a half hours of random time on my calendar. Mm -hmm. Now it may not align exactly right. So maybe Tuesday morning, I have nothing planned to do because I'm just holding on. And I'm yeah. like, Hey, nothing happened. Like I don't need it yet. Well, because I have my plan for the week. I can look ahead and say, what was I planning on doing later that I could actually just knock out right now? And I move those, I swap those two pieces around. I still keep that hour, right? Because yeah. I, I know something's coming. Yes. And so oh, rather is. than, and what this is allowing me to do is to knock it overbooked, knock it overscheduled. And then maybe it's Friday, you know, when the proverbial, you know, what hits the fan. Uh -huh. Well, I can absorb it now so much easier because I've, I've been protective and holding on going, I know I'm going to need it just as I could go into that bank account and go, whew, we've got the funds to get those new tires. Cause I've been saving, you know, every week or every month, well, we can actually learn how to do the same thing with our time so that when we need it, we have it and we don't actually go in time debt. It's, I mean, there's so many similar principles of finances and time that we can use with our planning. That is such a great way to think about it because, you know, I think in some ways people grasp the financial thing more easily it's because you can see it, it's tangible, it, right? Yeah. It's tangible. There's numbers on a, you know, on a spreadsheet or whatever. And you're like, oh, okay, well, if I spend that, I'm going in the red and then we got a real problem. Um, but it, and you've seen my weekly planning process with yeah. the way I teach it. That's what we're doing is we're making it so you can see it. Because when you build your plan out and you're putting in actual, well, guess what? That 45 minute soccer practice. No, but there's the prep time. There's the make, getting the snack, the finding the cleats, whatever. Then there's the drive time. And I sit in the park and then I come home. And now suddenly we're reflecting our calendar is showing that's 90 minutes tomorrow instead of just soccer practice at four. It's like, no, soccer practice starts at, for us at 3.30 and doesn't end until 5.15. Yeah. So we're, we're finding a way to visually show what it is that we are juggling, how much time it's going to take. And for a lot of people, the first time they do it, they're like, well, no wonder I'm so overwhelmed. I physically don't have the time to do the things that are on, that were sitting on my list. And I, I didn't, I couldn't see it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. And I know we'll, we'll get there, but last year when I did um, your program plan a Palooza, which we will, we'll talk about, you had us sort of block out the whole year. The whole year what yeah. are those times, those time, you know, blocks of time that you are gone or don't for whatever reason have available. And I remember looking at my calendar going, well, holy 
crap. No wonder I'm not getting all the things done that I wow. feel like I should be getting done. And then I had the opportunity to say, do I want to get rid of a vacation, right? And mm -hmm. try to get more done. Or do I want to say, I'm going to get less done and keep that vacation because that's where my values are right now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, hint, hint, I kept the vacation. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm even dealing with it right now. Tomorrow, my husband's getting on a plane and he's going to be gone for 16 days off the grid. Actually, your neck of the woods doing the Wonderland Trail. Um, they oh, got a lottery fantastic. draw for that. And we've known about this for a while. And that's one of those things that, that this is more at that annual planning level, right? We said there was four levels. Weekly is the lowest, annual is the highest. And what that has allowed me to do for the last six months since we've known that this is happening is as I get requests from people, hey, Megan, are you available to do a workshop? Hey, could you come train over here? And I can see visually I've drawn out, this is not the time for you to say yes to anything. You're yeah. running the show by yourself for, that means all the driving, all the everything. But normally we don't have those tools to see that to help us make those decisions. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because as we think about those, you know, the, the week and the puzzle pieces, I, I'm already... Like, well, this coming week, so my husband's getting on a plane tomorrow and flying to Stockholm for a business oh, meeting wow. that we've only known about for a little over a week. Yeah, that's a little more stressful. <laughs> that now you're moving a lot of puzzle pieces around. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of, a lot of puzzle pieces getting moved around next week mm -hmm. because, you know, we normally are, are both juggling all of the things and now I am juggling all of the things. Um, and so, you know, I, that puzzle, those puzzle pieces will be really helpful as I think about where can I move stuff and what do I have the bandwidth for? Yeah. And maybe I just have to say no to some things, right? Yeah. I mean, we, I, I had to cancel a few things, but I canceled them way in advance. I'm like, it's just going to be the one thing too many, yeah. just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yes. Right. And I'm like, I can, but I know it'll kill me. So no, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So once somebody grasps that, that idea of sort of planning out the week and they're like, okay, I'm, I'm managing my time account, my bank account pretty well, moving the pieces around. Where do we go from there? Do we continue? So that next level up then is monthly planning. Um, and because I want you to get out of the weeds and out of the daily stress and overwhelm before now we can go, okay, I, I'm like, got my daily life semi under control. So now we move on to monthly planning and the real purpose of monthly planning is to, it's ultimately all around boundaries and to prevent you from over committing. Cause I know we all have this where we're like, oh man, this month's a doozy. If I can just get through this month, next month is going to be better. Next month's never better, right? Because we don't know how to plan out our months to see, okay, here's what next month is shaping up for. I now already know, I, like I'm kind of in lockdown mode. I'm going to be saying no to anything extra that I don't need. So that's kind of that next level up. And then the third one is quarterly planning. And I love quarterly planning because this is where we actually make a lot of magic happen on our goals and our longer term projects, mm -hmm. especially if you have a very full life with a family and all of that, it always seems like those dreams, those pro that room we were going to redecorate or that book you wanted to write or those dance classes you wanted to take. So I know you do that. They always get put on the back burner, right? Because we're stuck in this day to day. We can't see how to get there. Yeah. And so quarterly planning is where we go through. It's about a nine step planning process that helps you pre-plan and put the structure in place to help make sure you have time for the things you've decided are important to you, your family, your mental health, all of that. Yeah. And so when people ask me, they're always like, how is it that you always have these goals and you're always, you know, doing these projects, whatever. I'm like, it's because of my quarterly planning process. Yeah. Um, and then the final one that we mentioned is that annual planning, which is what I teach once a year in my Planapalooza event. Which is such a cool event. And um, <laughs> I, I I found out about your work in that event for the first time last year in 2023 um, at a point when I was like, whoo, overwhelm is high. Um, you know, all of the planning methods that I've tried, quote unquote, aren't working for me. No. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of ideas because I'm one of those, you know, I just, the ideas. That Same. But I don't have time, right? But but I'm never doing them. 
Um, and so I signed up for it and I loved it. And I like, I've got your, you know, the, the workbook from it right over here. I printed out the one for this coming year um, because I, I will just be got mine again. today for this coming year, my hard copy. Oh. So this is it for the October event. Yes. So pretty. And it, and it gives you a way to go through things. So let's talk about that. What is yeah. Planet Palooza? What does it look like? How long does it last? What do people do? So Planet Palooza is, I only do it once a year. And it's the only place I really teach this, this concept of annual planning. And I always hold it in mid-October very intentionally, because let's face it, as soon as Halloween hits, it's nutso in November and December, navigating, like running the gauntlet towards December 31st. And so for most of people, it means they wake up on January 1 with kind of that like holiday hangover. And now they're like, oh gosh, well now I got to set goals and resolutions. And now the whole month is wasted trying to like recover and figure out what we want to do. So this is why I very intentionally do my annual planning in October for the next year because it sets me up for success in Q4 and then allows me to just welcome in the new year, already knowing kind of what I want to do and what it's going to look like. So it's a very methodical step-by-step -step annual planning process. I teach it over the course of two days um, and it's live with me. And if the timing doesn't work out for everybody, we record the whole thing. And then when we take the recordings, we actually break them up into each key leaning, learning point. So if you're like, hey, that part where we did our what if planning, I'd like a refresher on that. You'll very easily can go back and just watch that little segment. So we take a lot of time in, in dicing that up when it's yeah. done. That part um, was and, so helpful for me last year because there were a yeah. few parts where like I already had a meeting and I so I only missed an hour or in, you know two hours and I, it made it easy to go back and watch it yeah. later. And then what we're doing this year a little different is the event's going to be on a Thursday and a Friday. Uh, and we designed it this way so that people then have the weekend to let it sink in, absorb, maybe go rewatch something if you need to. And then on Monday, I'm coming back this year with a live two hour just Q&A. So this is a chance for people to come back and ask specific questions, things like that, to make sure they feel really good about the material. Um, and when you get your ticket, you get your complete workbook. It's a hundred or so pages. We give you a digital version. Um, you can print it, you can order a printed copy, but you get the digital with your ticket. Uh, and then we also brought in seven guest experts this year that have done pre-recorded training around a variety of topics that really, that usually a lot of people will come up and say, hey, do you have any tips on like financial annual planning? Or do you have any tips on how to get my digital life better organized? So each one of our key uh, guest expert speakers is doing a training on a very specific topic to support you. And those are actually going to be released a couple weeks before the event. So you can even go in and start watching those um, prior to the two-day event together as well. I did not know that piece. And I'm excited about that because- Well, I haven't, I haven't told everyone we're oh. doing that early. So this is like hot off the press. <laughs> hot off the presses. That's super exciting because last year, I remember I watched a bunch of them. And the one that I really, um, that and then I, I did some, uh, her little program was Katie Wells, which is like- She's- yeah, she's my go-to for my house. everything decluttering and what she's teaching this year, like that alone, just get the ticket to go watch <laughs> Katie Wells' yeah. recording, but it's all teaching this concept of daily resets and resets you can do in your home. They have changed our entire home. So I will tell you, definitely go listen. To yeah, those. yeah, I will. I will. We, we actually do an evening reset every night. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we run the vacuum because we got three large dogs, uh, and two cats and, two kids it's just <laughs> yeah, chaos it's uh we run the vacuum and we do like a a five minute you know what what do we need to straighten up where do we need to go and I, I agree with you it just makes yeah I kind of have my world. midday one that I just I do and then we have our evening reset and there's three there's the three buckets and we all pick and choose who's uh, the three of us who's doing what each night and I mean it makes me not get annoyed to see the expected mess because I'm like we're good we have a yep. reset coming like Oh yeah. It's so good. It's so good. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, I, I mean, there's so many more questions because I'm like, oh, and I'm going to ask one of them because for very selfish reasons, Megan, <laughs> some of us are a little bit of a procrastinator, right? Like I, I go into procrastination yes. mode. Um, and I don't, I'm not proud of it, but I also find that 
and, and I've done this for as long as I can remember, that some of my most creative, like my best work happens when I'm at least a little bit under the gun. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll be like, oh yeah, I'm going to do that well in advance. And then when it comes to well in advance, I sit there and go, I, uh, I don't know what to do with myself, <laughs> but put me the night before I have to give a three hour presentation and I will rock it. Or at least I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I will say there is some validity to there are some people that do really well under pressure. Yeah. I I used to be one of those uh younger Megan. I can't do it anymore. I'm just of an age, I think menopause. I don't know. Like I don't I don't woohoo pull it together at the last minute. Now, yeah. I I love talking about procrastinating. I had my mom on my podcast once. And she very openly said that if it had been an Olympic sport, I would have been a gold medalist year after year after year. Um, I was a champion procrastinator. One, because I could pull it off at the last minute. Yeah. Um, but also I'm now learning one of the reasons in today's age we procrastinate so much is overwhelm actually is a culprit to it. Yeah. Because when we are so overwhelmed, and I talked about we go into that kind of fight or flight, you know, mentality, another one is freeze, right? Yes. And when we get so overwhelmed, sometimes we're just standing there going, I don't even, I don't even know where to start. So we're like, well, I'm gonna get a dopamine hit. So I'm gonna pull out my phone. And for me, that looks like going into Instagram reels and then forwarding like 35 of them to my two sisters in the course of a half an hour. Cause that's how I unplug language. and rewind. Yep. Um, but here's what I love about the weekly planning process that I teach. To me, it is my tool to help me not procrastinate. I still have the habit of procrastination. Yeah. But here's what my weekly plan does for me. Um, like, let's say I'm you know, looking at my plan and I'm realizing, oh, okay, today was the day this morning. Yeah, I've got about a 90 minute window that I need to sit down and write, you know, particular emails or a blog post or whatever. I do not like writing. Anytime I'm going to look and see, I've got to write those emails. My instant reaction is I'll do that later because yeah. I don't like it. Right. So I yeah. want to procrastinate. But when I then go look, and I keep looking over here because my plan is here. When I go look at my plan for the rest of the week to say, okay, I'm going to do it later. My plan is going to show me you don't have later, Megan. If you don't do it now, it's going to mean it, you're either waking up at four in the morning or working at night, which I don't work at night. My brain doesn't function well at night yeah. or something else you were planning to do this week is not going to get done. Now, do I still have a little temper tantrum? Do I still get annoyed? That I, you know, yes, but then I'm like, well, yeah, I better do it now because if I don't, I can clearly see I don't have later. Yeah. And this is yeah. one of the reasons why um, I have been able to really change my story on procrastination. Again, I still have the desire, it still bubbles up, but I literally talk myself through it. And I'll yeah. be like, okay, let's look at it. Can we do, and maybe I can look at it and go, I can do it later. And I decide to plan and move that time somewhere else. But now at least I know that's when I'm getting it done. So for me, that's not procrastinating. I'm just moving my plan around, yeah. but it is a game changer to help you honor what you said you needed to be spending your time on. Yeah. I, I so appreciate that because I, I will do the it's and it's particularly around tasks that I don't necessarily want to yeah. do hundred um, percent. And so I'll put that off. And I think you're right. It's, it's a bit overwhelmed. And even though I can pull it off and I, and I can stay up late and get it done. I don't enjoy that the way that I might've in my twenties. Cause no, and, and even though I say I can pull it off, Usually a few days later, I'll be like, oh, what if I had an idea that would have made it better? Then I'm like, if I had done it when I said I was going to, yeah. I would have had that spaciousness to get those, oh God, no, I'm going to go back and redo that because that would be better, right? And yes. I, the more I see that happen in my life, that also helps fuel me to go, no, we're not going to move this around and plan to do it at the last minute. All right. All right. I am going to make it as one of my goals for 2024 or 2025, at least, if not the rest of this year to reduce that 
procrastination instinct yeah. with being a little bit more diligent with my, with my weekly planning. And a lot of people will give you that tip. You know, they say eat the frog or whatever it is. Like, we'll just always do the, the hardest thing first. And I want to give you permission to not necessarily do that. Yeah. Because one of the things that we, I teach in the planning system as well is we need to learn when we do certain types of work best. And so there might be something that is like, if it's a technical task and I'm playing with software or something like that, I love that. Like that's where my old tech geek comes out. I actually want to dive in and do that first thing in the morning, yeah. but I know if I have any creative work, I'm better served doing that in the morning because it's harder for me in the afternoon. And so even though that big technical thing might've been the hardest and most important, I might choose to say, no, but I am not going to do that first. I'm not going to quote, eat the frog because I know what, how my brain works best and how my energy levels flow. And I'm better served using my morning brain on these things yeah. instead. So you don't always have to eat the frog. Well, and that's, I think that's such an important point. And also recognizing that what might be my frog. Oh yeah. Than your frog. Good percent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that we, that's where knowing ourselves and what we mm -hmm. enjoy doing and what we don't enjoy doing or what we, because I sometimes think for me, it's like, I feel like I should like doing that thing, but then every time it comes to do it, I don't want to do it. I don't. Yeah. 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 Megan, this has been so good. And uh, I am very much looking forward to Planet Palooza again in October. I've already got it blocked out on my calendar. And uh, I, just, I have one thing I have to move around a little bit just to make sure I can, I, I want to be there for the whole thing this time. Um, and I know that people listening are like, okay, this could help me. Yes. So um, yeah, I, if you are listening and you're thinking that, that this could help you, you're right. It can. Um, and there will be a link in the show notes for where you can sign up for Plan of Palooza. Tell us the dates, Megan, just so people have got that down. Yeah. So it is October 17th and 18th. It's that Thursday and Friday. And then I'm going to be doing the Q&A the following Monday. But again, if you're already like, no, we're on a vacation, like you will get all the recordings and you'll have access to them through the entire rest of the year. So you can kind of work through it at your pace and follow along because you'll get the workbook and all of that. Um, and I, my guarantee to you is you will look at 2025 very differently than how you have ever looked at any previous years. And it isn't about me telling you how to get more done. That is not, that is not what this is about. That's not what I'm about. It's about helping you connect back to what's important to you, what's important for your family, where is it that you want to create budget for, you know, time budget in your lives? And then realistically, all right, how do we actually make this happen? Yeah. You know, it was when I did it last year that I finally felt entitled because you really asked people to look at that, that question of what matters to you and your values. And I finally felt entitled, truly entitled to take my Friday mornings and take that dance class that I mentioned to you. And, and I've now added in another fun little hobby that I, I am making time for throughout yeah. the week, because I know that that will serve me and ultimately my family in the long run, because I'm getting what I need out of my weeks. Well, it's funny. It was two years ago at Planet Plus. I think this is the fifth year I've done this. Um, you know, I always have a list of things that I want to do and I'm always openly sharing it when I'm teaching. And one of the things that had been on my list for years was wanting to learn how to play the cello. I, I know other instruments, but I've never played a string. Always wanted to do that. And I, I was showing kind of my want tos. And one of the students said, I saw that on your, I've seen that on your list for a couple years now. Like, when is that going to make it to the top? And I was like, this might be the year. And sure enough, I've been taking cello lessons for the last two years. Uh, so that's my, that's my thing every Thursday that I do for me, which I love. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, and, and what I think that really illustrates is that there can be time for some yeah. of these things that bring us joy. We just and have I to still every week, some weeks I'm like, Oh, I better cancel my life. I'm like, no. And, yeah. and I don't, and I'm so glad I don't. Yeah. Love it. Megan, thank you so much for so welcome. Thank to you. This. Yeah, there's a lot of wisdom in this. And um, and I think this is one piece of that puzzle of helping reduce that overwhelm that the Surgeon General is talking about. Prepare, yes. right? 
we, we can we can get rid of at least some of that yeah thank you thanks all right people was i right was i right she's pretty awesome right she is pretty darn awesome because for me what she has done is help me see that I can in fact bring things into my life that I want in my life right I can make time for those and I can and I can sort of evaluate where I am and figure out am I trying to cram too much into the available minutes of the day oftentimes the answer to that question is yes um, and she really helps has really helped me see how to move the puzzle pieces around in a way that feels well frankly more heartful um, to bring it back you know to the work that I do um, and to bring a little bit more work-life harmony and and I love both her positivity and her really clear boundaries and the way that she helps moms set boundaries that honor yourself your family and your values so if you found that to be really um you know kind of a different way of thinking about things looking at things and you would like to explore the work that megan does planapalooza is a fabulous place to start um and you know i am wholeheartedly supporting her program you can um well you can frankly if i'm being real honest folks you can support Megan's work and you can support my work by using the link that's in the show notes to join Planapalooza. It's super reasonably priced, especially given everything that she delivers with it. It is two days or, you know, it, it's spread over two days. It's not two like eight hour days, but spread over two days, chock full of incredible content that will help you feel like you're starting 2025 with a plan that will work. So I highly, highly encourage you to join me. I will be there. I will be there doing uh, Plan of Plan for 2025 as I look to the next year and look to make it an even better, uh, even more heartful one than this year. With that, have a fantastic week. Have an organized, planned week, and I'll see you next week. Cheers.